Thank you for joining us at home. We are dedicating the next few episodes to conversations on race. Our goal for this podcast from the very beginning was to simply have meaningful conversations about the foundations of home life because we really believe that the values we learn at home are those that we often live by and carry with us into the world. So we would like to share with you our journey in learning more about the systemic racism that has brought us to this day. Sadly, we as a whole have led atrocities against all minorities, particularly black people, compound for far too long. And in our ignorance, the lives of many innocent people have been tragically lost to violence. We hope that by sharing our learning process, we can encourage you to look deeper as well, to reflect on our own biases, to be curious and challenge our own ideologies, and to listen and to open our minds and hearts to just have these difficult conversations. And we're confident that this is the path to positive change and that it can all start with each one of us right at home. We'd like to thank each of our experts in this series. We look to them for insight on how we can better communicate and for the tools each of us can practice to eradicate racism and create a just society for all. We're truly thankful for their selflessness to share their knowledge with us. In this episode, we chat with Kenny Leon on the power of story to change the world. Kenny is an award-winning Broadway, TV, and film director who has brought to life impactful stories such as American Son with Kerry Washington and Fences with Denzel Washington and Viola Davis. If you'd like to learn more, we will be sharing resources on our website, at homepodcast.net, and on social media. And listen to our other guests in this series, Jane Elliott on One Human Race. And Dr. Howard Stevenson on racial literacy. This is Kenny Leon. Obviously, everyone's in isolation at home at first, and then this past week has been really a heavy week. Um, how, how are your emotions, and how are your feelings, and, and yeah, you and Jen... Wow. <laughs> um, I actually think the devastating uh, pandemic has been really good in terms of the stillness of the planet. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, to have uh, this epidemic about race to come to light again. And in many ways, I think because there was a pandemic, we were able to see the epidemic. Mm. And unfortunately, like in my family, my mother uh, lost two sisters and a brother uh, to COVID. And in two weeks time, we had three virtual funerals. So I want to honor the life of all those, all all the lives lost. I want to honor that because that is, is real. And uh, at the same time, it has allowed us to really get deep into this greater virus, uh, uh, that of race specifically toward African-American men and women. And um, all that said, you know, I look back, it's been, it's 400 years, 400 years that we've been dealing with uh, race in America, racism in America. And, um, and enough already. The the good thing about this, I think that for the first time in my lifetime, uh, and I came up in the early seventies, I think my white friends have a different kind of ear now and that we have a moment to really a, a little to do something about um, criminal injustices against blacks in our country. And it is unfortunate that the, um, the leadership in our country is just uh, horrific. But uh, I think that the goodwill and the good heart and the good souls of people will point us uh, in a better direction. Mm-hmm. And I'm, ho- I'm hopeful that this, this is a great moment well worth the lives lost in the uh, racial injustice movement and well worth the lives lost during COVID-19. There are so many people that this is really sort of an awakening of, of people understanding that the they need to communicate. People need to speak their voices. You know, people of, of the black community as well as um, ourselves and, and everybody else who are supporting change and eradicating this racial injustice. 
Um, but I think w w what I really love that I'm seeing on social media is that so many people are understanding that one of the first things that we need to do is look to leaders, uh, educators who understand racial literacy, who understand how to communicate this change um, in a way that will actually step us all forward. Mm -hmm. And people like yourselves, Kenny, who, who use your platform day in and day out to tell these stories that need to be heard. So are you able to tell our listeners about what you do? Yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting. I got a call today from uh, an African-American lawyer of a big corporation. And she just called to say, I want to thank you, Kenny Leon. And I said, well, what do you mean? We're all going through the same things and it's horrible. But she said, I want to thank you for always using your platform to tell the stories about this moment. Whether that was your production of A Raisin in the Sun on Broadway, which dealt with justices in the real estate market, or if it was Fences, when I dealt head on when I had Denzel watch it and Viola Davis play in that wonderful story about injustice in the 60s. And then, um, you know, last year I did American Sun for Netflix and which is a, a, a film about, you know, about black mothers not able to see their sons come home. And now on Netflix, that is really um, more and more people have in the past couple of weeks have been really tuned in on that again. And and I think Kerry Washington is just a, a major artist who's really just serves that play really well. But more than that, she tells the story that um, so many women, a, example, when we first opened American Sun, we screened it in five cities and we came to Atlanta and we had 29 mothers, black mothers who had lost their sons <laughs> to um, police violence. And so that was last year. And, 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 and it's been rampant for years and years. But now at least we have the ear and the attention of folks who are going to look at the stories and let the story serve as, as a as truth tellers of what we're actually uh, dealing with day to day. And mm -hmm. I just think that if we get this right, then we have a much more, much more beautiful place to live and call country. Mm -hmm. And um, so good relationships and good dealing with injustice is good for everybody. It is. I mean, that that's the, the one thing I think a lot of, a lot of us realize, but I, th I, I almost feel that a lot of people didn't, they, they, they felt that, you know, if you're white, that this is something that's scary. Even if you you don't agree with racism, which I'm, I hope all of our listeners um, are in the same uh, mind thought that we are, but they, they were scared to be a part of it because they didn't understand what they could do. Um, and so they just back away. And that doesn't help anything. At the end of the, the day, if we all are treated the way we should all be treated, it's going to be a hell of a lot happier a planet. Um, in, in your films and uh, in your plays, because we actually, we saw American Sun uh, on Broadway, and it was extremely moving. And I mean, thank you again for um, for what you did. And Carrie was amazing. Um, how do you, if you're reviving something that is a story that has been told for many decades, um, and you're bringing it to light right now in today's climate, how do you feel about the thought that a lot of what the issue is hasn't changed over the past 50 years? We have the exact same issues that we've had over the past 50 years. Well, you know, I'm, uh, Drew, I'm just built that way. Like, I will always believe in love. I have no other option. I, I, I just I just do. And so when the pandemic hit, I was I had a play on Broadway uh, entitled A Soldier's Play, which dealt with injustices in our military. So every time I approach a play, like I approached that play as if it was a new play. It was written 40 years ago, but I approached it like it was written today. So then I had um, Nipsey Hussle's music in it. I had like, you know, hip hop music from the day in it. I had uh, an American flag in the backdrop because I'm still trying to reach people where they sit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that we have to keep saying we're not living in the past. We're living now. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping that over time we will beat the evil down. We will beat injustice down. And um we just got to keep keep doing that. And I tell my white friends when they call and they say, what can we do? And I say, well, you can listen. But number two, what we all can do is just small acts, small acts of, uh, of, of how you treat decent humans. It's, let's have one one justice system. 
Let's just treat everybody the way you want to be treated and speak up whenever you hear injustices anywhere. If you're on a golf course and someone tells a, 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 a gay joke or a racial joke, Correct it right then. If you live next door to a black or an Asian or Hispanic and you happen to be white, then walk next door and say hello. You know, uh, you know, let's open up conversations. Let's try to have that that the goal of having one humanity, because Mm -hmm. over time, I don't think that these boxes of race, black and white, will be able to contain us. You know, I think that eventually we have to get to the place where we're contained by our decent humanity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and we've seen, you know, through and through again, that these boxes, these social constructs that make up such a thing as race have not served us and they've, they've just created more divide. So I, I love when you say, you know, it's never too late to do the right thing because we are all connected. Yeah. Well, you look at... Uh uh, racial stereotypes um, and how society in general just keeps playing into that over and over and over. And something that has really frustrated uh, me to see is when, when you think of people say, well, I mean, look at the black community and look at our prisons. The majority of people in prison it's the, uh, are, are of the black community. Well, why is that? And that's because of the way that people have been stereotyping for so many years and targeting the black community for crimes or petty crimes that shouldn't be something that people are going away for 10, 20 years for. And that's just how the the justice system was built up to create revenue out of the prison system. And so um, in your mind, when you look at something like that, where you have been, uh, the black community have been targeted for so many years, how, how do you, when something has been reinforced and reinforced for so many years, um, how do you break into that slow and steady to change that viewpoint from all these people that have been just used to this? Well, honestly, um, over my 60 years, what happens is, I I remember when I first got into entertainment and my mother said, if you're gonna be in this industry, you either have to be a snake or a snake charmer. And I was like, I'm not a snake. So what's happened over these years, you learn how to maneuver, how to jump through hoops, how to expect racism when you go in to to be interviewed for a job as director at a studio. It's like, okay, I know what I would say, but I know what he's expecting me to say, so let me say this so that I can get the job. And... um, and uh, I think right now we have a different sort of moment. We have uh, we have people like, for instance, I read uh, the guy ahead uh, of Peloton. It came out and and I felt it was very authentic. And he said, here, I'm going to give this money to this organization. I admit where I fall short. Let's work on that. And I think we have the ear of of, of well-intentioned people uh, and we have the ear of corporations and it's going to take it's going to take some time. But even when you think about the history of this country and when I tell my white friends, I said, do you realize that, you know, many hundreds of years ago, we weren't allowed to read. We weren't allowed to educate ourselves uh, the, the, to pursue uh, uh, religion. So all of that was taken away. And during that time. White men became rich, wealthy, you know, and now if those white folks have maintained that land over all those years and have locked out other, uh, even black folks now with the money to purchase, they can't buy it because it's like, no, we're going to keep that land. And so when when some whites say, pull yourself up by the bootstraps or do this, I think we we all need to go back and revisit history mm-hmm. and need to see how it's all intertwined together. So we have a a big issue, which is I think is the sort of it's our original sin. And until we just face that and say that, hey, you know what, slavery happened, and you know what, we're a better country because of slavery. Because you know, you, slavery gave this country free labor, <laughs> and in some sort of way, we have to go back and address that. It's not about, so number one, you have to admit that it happened. Number two, you have to admit that the country benefited from it. And number three, you have to admit that those sins still are with us. 
Mm-hmm. So, I mean, me even looking back, I was born into privilege, and this is something that I think over the years um, I haven't known how to use my voice that can actually help um, eradicate uh, racial injustice. And I, I, you know, I haven't been through the same suffering that a lot of people in the black community have been through. And and the history that you're speaking of is it's frustrating to see. You know, real estate, as you mentioned, is a prime example. The people don't realize just having property alone, just the white people having property alone over these generations and generations, how much wealth that's built. Well, then you say, well, now, you know, black people are allowed to own property. So what's the problem? We fixed it. Yeah, we can't we can't look at that and say we are all treated equally or have the equal opportunities because you didn't. You could have Linda, you can have the property over there near that factory that where the cancer rate is up mm-hmm. higher. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. But you can't have this property over here. We can't change the past, but now we can use that as a tool to educate ourselves on what the mistakes we won't continue to make. And so for somebody like myself, what what, what do you see that are other ways that we can continue to try and change um, the opinion of others out there who might not even be realizing that these small, subtle things they're doing are racist. These small, subtle things they're doing is um, further stretching injustice. I think what I would say to you is have people say, use your imagination and imagine if you were not in the majority. And if you just would imagine that, imagine yourself as 12% of the population and and, and, you know, just how you talk to people, how you listen to people. You know, someone says like, well, I like Trump because I like his policies. And it's like, how can you how can you even say that? Because we have to look at our our country and our planet as um, as one. So the gap between the haves and the have nots have grown. So we have to really look at the. Um, the big picture. I was talking to another friend about just the idea about the census coming up. And, 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 you know, now is it, it, it's been extended to October 15th, which is great. I think that's the date, Mm -hmm. but so many of us are not doing what we need to do to be counted. And whatever happens in 2020 will be with us for, um, for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. That includes how money flows into our schools um, our neighborhoods. Um, so I would just encourage all of our friends to look at the big picture. Just take time to think of everybody. What if you were not in the majority? What, what if you did not live in your big house on the good side of town? What if, and just try to imagine that world from another person's uh, eyes. And that's what great filmmaking, great plays and great stories do. They let us look at the world through someone else's eyes. Mm -hmm. And if we would just do that, I think we would learn an incredible lot. So I'm just asking everybody to listen and to look and to use your, uh, to use Netflix and, and, and YouTube and all of our platforms for storytelling and look at it through someone else's eyes and really apply that to your worldview. Mm-hmm. Can you talk about the responsibility of those in the the film and entertainment industry to to use this platform as you know a way to change the narrative and tell the stories that matter? Then I think it's almost impossible. I, I say to people, if you're the if you're art, into art and entertainment, if you're the same artist after this pandemic and after the killing of innocent. Black people, and after all the marches and all the stuff we're going through now, if you're the same human being uh, or the same artist after that, then you haven't learned anything Mm. because we've changed. We changed forever. It's like, oh wow, how does this time find itself in my future stories? You know what I mean? How can uh, you know? um, How can you? not write about our, our connectedness to each other as human beings? How can you not write about racism and injustice whenever you see it? And, 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 and not all stories should preach, you know, because the, the, the first part of the word entertainment is enter. So there should be a door for mm-hmm. all to enter. 
you know, to 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 be changed, to be to be a better human being. So I think that storytelling, which has been with us for since the very beginning, can sort of help us get through some of these our ideas about mm -hmm. uh, injustice. And, and I've I've seen you know there are people who who write about you know fear that if we get too real with film and TV or um, or. Uh, in theater, and we take these issues of today and the issues of the past, and we showcase it um, in too real a way that it's very scary for people to see, and that they feel that that could be a negative. Um, I mean, my, I think that it, I think it's important for us to see the truth of what's out there, and then people will start to open up their eyes to these issues. What, what's your thought? You know, if you tell everybody's story, or the more stories you tell from a varied group of people, you know. The, the 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 more you're going to touch people's lives, but on top of that, the more money you're going to make as a business model. So yeah. if you just want to talk business, why it is it is advantageous to tell everybody's story. I just wanted to go back to American Son. I remember how we felt when we were sitting in that theater, and it was you're right. It was hard to sit through uh, because there was so much quiet uh, mm. and and uncertainty from the mother's point of view. Um, but to that point, because it was such a, it is such a violent context, but it's important to not always glorify the violence and tell the deeper stories. And I think that's exactly what you did that made us understand her pain and, and the deeper, the, the deeper prejudices that, that lie, you know, in, in the news clips that we see, we often don't see the, the enduring pain that the families go through. Right. You know, one thing I always tell folks, the great August Wilson said this to me when he was alive. He said, Kenny, sometimes you have to understand that we are the filler. It's like sometimes we think of the commercials as the filler. But no, in our country, sometimes we are the filler. So uh, if you look at, for instance, if you look at the news, it would be great if the news just gave us the news. But many times it's about selling soap powder in cars. So it's like, how do we keep these people here? So, oh, we just we'll just call it breaking news mm -hmm. for 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to we're going to highlight on not on the the protesters that are peacefully marching. We're going to focus on those 10 people over here in the corner that's setting a fire to a car. So, mm -hmm. yes, let's just focus on that. So. Back to what you said, Drew, it still comes back to money, even when we present the news, even mm -hmm. when we, you know, you know, create our movies or our plays. I, I find that's very frustrating as well when you look at the news specifically. And there, there are messages out there that uh, people speaking up, using their voices, and it, it's important to hear Yet then they'll cut away and try to tie to that these people who are looting and rioting that actually have nothing to do with this cause about racial justice. It's Correct. just people taking advantage of a situation um, and and for their own personal gains, again, stealing or breaking into stores for their own personal gains. So that that is annoying to see that it clouds the message that needs to be heard for change to come forward. On the on the film side of things and theater side, I mean, you're an amazing award-winning director. You've had a long career working with such huge, amazing talent. Um, for you, when you have a story that has a lot of meaning and it's an important message for people to hear and you bring in the cast like Denzel Washington uh, or um, Viola Davis or uh, Kerry Washington, um, and then you... Uh, you work together to bring that message forward. What is that experience like for you when you can come together with other amazing, uh, talented people in the entertainment industry, but together collectively you're raising awareness of a, of a cause that's important to you? It's nothing better. There's nothing better uh, when you believe in the project and the message of what you're uh, putting out into the world. And when you're surrounded by like-minded uh, politically uh, focused human beings. And just to use some of the people that you talked about, you know, I did the mountaintop with Samuel L. Jackson and Angela Bassett, you know, like uh, I know those two people personally and they want to change the world and they don't want to use their stories to preach to you. So they still want to be entertain you, but in the course of entertainment, they're trying to say something or Denzel and Viola, 
uh, you know, incredible. You know, I did the story of Tupac Shakur and, and holler if you hear me. And that was a, another opportunity to speak to the community. But sometimes you have to realize as an artist, sometimes the community is not ready for your message or sometimes uh, you don't have the right audience or the or the encouraging of the right audience to see your work or the right money behind your your um your, your your property so that others may see it and appreciate it and and use it in their daily lives you know everyone consumes entertainment how can we support stories and and makers who are telling these stories i think um what the world needs now is just access you know um Everybody's story needs to be given a chance or an opportunity to be told. So a lot of these studios and a lot of uh, uh, Broadway organizations, they need to diversify just who, who who's making the decisions. You know, if you have a, a, a company that portends to say that we are reaching everybody and telling everybody's story, and then you say, well, when's the last time that you had an, an Asian-American story? on Broadway. So, oh, well, that's because you don't have any Asian Americans working in your company. And, and that's not, uh, uh, that your core values don't include justice and inclusion. You're just saying it. So I think we need to see who, who are the players, um, you know, with our companies and to see, and, and how big is our, our circle of friends, Mm-hmm. Who, who, who are we talking to? Who are we saying things to? Uh, who are we having parties with? Um, I think during this time of uh, shutdown, you know, it's given me a lot of time to just think personally about myself, you know, and, and how do you want to spend your time on the planet? Mm-hmm. And who do you want to spend that time with uh, and around whom? Uh, so uh, you guys have always been, you know, out there pushing great things, you know what I mean? Uh, only thing I can say to to Lyndon Drew is like, we just got to keep doing what we've been doing. You got to do more of it and you got to like say it to people who don't necessarily, uh, who can't necessarily see it now. Mm-hmm. And so it is uh, my friend, um, Stacey Abrams, what I like about her, she, uh, she can take a big idea and make it so crystal clear for everybody. Mm -hmm. And so as a part of what we need to do is like, we have to figure out a way to make uh, justice and being right and doing right to make it so basic and so plain to all of those in our circle. Mm -hmm. And we have to do that on our platforms as well, I think. Mm -hmm. But I think we had a, a real special moment now and we have an opportunity to change the world for, you know, for our grandkids upstairs, you know, we, to, 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 so that they don't have to jump over these same hoops, you know, 20 years from now. Mm-hmm. Uh, a big thing that Linda and I strongly feel with every aspect um, of our lives is that it all starts at home. Um, the way we communicate with our family, the way anyone would communicate to their kids or grandkids, that can really affect all aspects of their life. And so when you're looking at racial injustice, um, how how have you prepared your kids or grandkids for the world as it is right now? And what are you hoping that that communication at home can can be like to prep them for a different a change for the future? Well, one thing I try to give them truth as they're able to receive it. You know, one is four and one is two, so I haven't been shying away from you know why do we have on the mask Corona. Uh, what is Corona? It's, it's bad, you know, and, and when we sit down to eat, uh, and the two year old doesn't get it yet, but when we sit down to eat, we bow our heads, uh, no matter who you pray to is acknowledging that something is bigger than you. So we try to do by our actions, we do that. Or if my four year old wants to, you know, he's Opa, Opa, Opa. And I was like, what do you say first? He said, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Correct. Say, excuse me. Okay, now you can speak. And then mm-hmm. what I do is I listen to them. Go ahead, talk. Let me listen to you. What do you have to say? You know, so the, the way I want the world to be, 
I'm it in their world. So I'm always listening mm-hmm. to them. I'm attentive to them. Uh, I teach them uh, manners. Um, if someone opens a door for them, even if it's a stranger, they have to say thank you. You know, you'll be surprised at the the way people raise their children never to say thank you. They say, oh, that's so cute. Just No, it's not cute. Those little things become big ideas. At one point, Donald Trump was four years old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, and we learn behavior and we grow into it. So um, I try to show compassion. Um, I try to, the way I want them to be, I try to demonstrate that. Uh, I've been working a lot on, um, it's a book I've been reading by Ryan Holiday um, about stillness, the stillness of the mind. So I've been trying to work on that and not to act when I'm angry, um, just Still your mind, slow the world down, observe the beauty. Don't just take a picture of the sunset, observe the sunset. Mm. Um, so, you know, I'm working on myself and trying to uh, translate that to my grandkids. And I think that's what all of us can do. You know, it starts with your grandkids. And then if you haven't spoken to your, 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 your kid, uh, your grown kid for a while, pick up the phone and do that. If you haven't spoken to your your sister in a while, pick up the phone and do that. Mm-hmm. You know, I just believe um, that this moment is here for us to seize it. And I choose to believe that the majority um, of, of our country means well and they want to do well. And they and so I want to do that. And, and, and I think there's much to be learned. You know, if you're black, there's much to be learned. If you're white, there's much to be learned. And I want us to really just look for that day when there's just there's just one justice, mm-hmm. one justice system, one true uh, justice system, not one true justice. Mm-hmm. System. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Just letting your kid know that they're entitled, you know, you know, just like sometimes just being in the majority is nothing that you did wrong. You didn't do anything wrong. That's just you're you're born white in America. And just because of that, entitlement comes with that. Mm-hmm. That's just, that's what happens when you're in a majority. So you have to be sensitive, sensitive to that. And how do you adjust to that to make sure there is equal justice for everybody? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's one thing to be able to send our kids to um, private schools. Mm-hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But wouldn't it be great if we <laughs> also made sure that all the public schools had equal access as well. Mm -hmm. So the way we care about our private schools, what if we cared about that for all our public schools, you know, and uh, I've been learning a lot, like even like we're able to zoom and, and, and I did a virtual, um, uh, a virtual uh, uh, speech for the international thespian uh, festival. And uh, in that process, I realized that not everybody even ha- has internet. Not mm-hmm. everyone has a, a computer or an iPhone. And, you know, so we have, to, we have to start imagining that everybody doesn't have everything that your family has. Mm-hmm. And then how do we give everybody basic equal rights mm-hmm. and access? Exactly. So with your imagination, can you crystallize for us your big dream? Wow. My big dream has to be almost going back to what Dr. King said, where we're a world where we're all judged by the character of our content. It's like when I see little kids, it's like when they're real little, they, they are not racist at all. They're like, and they'll tell you the truth. They might say, uh, auntie has a mustache. <laughs> 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 and they might dislike you because you smell or whatever, but they just, you know, the, one of the most beautiful images to me is to see a long line of like second graders walking down the street, holding hands, regardless of gender, regardless of race. I was like, wow, wouldn't that be great if adults behave that way? Mm. So I guess my dream would be like, if as adults, we held on to our, three-year-old selves. Mm. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, th- that would be a beautiful planet. That would be a, a beautiful place to live. Yeah, that would be great. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with so. with um, the education system, uh, and I know you're asked to speak a lot, uh, to do a lot of keynotes and, and lectures. Um, what do you think is something that could be implemented in our school systems that can help create this change, um, different thought processes, and improved communication when it comes to racial literacy? Wow. You know, I did a thing at, I think it was PS, PS23, in New York City, and uh, this is a wonderful school. And they asked me to come in. They said, we want you to come in and read a book to the uh, kindergarten and first graders. And, I, and in my own prejudice, I'm thinking like, kindergarten and first grader, that, you know, am I going to be able to hold their attention? He said, yes, we want you to come in. We want you to talk about what you do. So I came into this classroom. Wow, guys, these kids had... Uh, read uh, or been read to about theater, about what a director does, uh, about what Broadway is. Um, they, they had read or been read to about when I did um, Children of a Lesser God and worked with the deaf community. And some of these kids in this room were deaf or hard of hearing as well. And it was just amazed me that this teacher had them studying uh, like uh, stories by the Greeks and they were, uh, you know, so they were like Greek, Greek mythology. And, and now they understood uh, Broadway and what I did. And what I realized by that is like the capacity for learning is greater than, uh, than we would uh, acknowledge. Mm-hmm. And so I say stop treating our young people like they're lesser our young people are, are are greater. They could they could get into Shakespeare in first grade. They mm-hmm. can get into the great books right now. Other schools like that. There's, there's something called a speech school in Atlanta, Georgia, where they just treat the kids with respect from you know from pre kindergarten on. And I was like, wow, some kids will never have that. Mm. Because, you know, our school system is not set up that way. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think we need more compassion in our schools and more more justice and, and thinking that anyone in that room, anyone in that community could be president of the United States. Mm-hmm. There are we future treat leaders. everyone like that. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, when you, our, our whole, our society in general could, could take a note from those young kids that, that you're talking about that are that were well read, educated, excited, and passionate curious. and curious. I think that's yeah. one thing that I would re- I would love to see more of is people who continue to want to learn. They want to always continue to learn, to grow, to be curious, and to have those conversations. Yeah. I love what you said because that's also what I'm learning during these times. You know, yeah, it's like you know we're dealing with this this injustice issue and we're dealing with the pandemic at the same time, but. I'm using this time to grow. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was like, wow, when, do, when, when are you going to stop growing, Kenny Leon? As long as I'm on the planet, I want to keep growing. I want to keep learning. You know, Kerry Washington, for instance, taught me a lot just about the, the power of the, the female voice and how I, how I should respect it. And I thought I was respecting it, but she taught me a lot about being female in America. And I was like, wow, as a man, I could learn from that. I can grow from that. And we all can, we can just keep growing. Mm-hmm. How beautiful that would be if we just kept growing. It's, it's um, the, the thought, you know, kids are in school. That's when they, they, you know, they learn and they grow. And then once you're out of school, it's time to get serious and get your job. And I, f- I feel too many people think that the growing has stopped. You're now just in your work life and that we, we need to break free of that thought. We always need to grow. And, you know, young minds are, are like sponges. And I think it, it's, it's interesting when you see, you know, that you'll see clips on YouTube or, or somebody posting something and it's, you take something like, like racial prejudice and some, somebody's trying to explain to a kid, you know, what that is. And all the kid keeps saying is why they keep trying to dig more. Well, why why is the white community more privileged than the black community? And then trying to explain that, but that doesn't make sense to the kids. But why we're all the same? And I think there's so much that we can learn from these little kids because they're That's not good. they're not clouded by the misinformation and communication out yeah. there. Yeah, and we have to stop just accepting what our ancestors passed down. Right, mm. you hit it. You hit it, guys. That's 
That's what I would pray for, for all Americans, just to make a commitment to continue to grow. Yeah. That's not too much to ask. If we just said, okay, everybody, let's just grow. That's, that's a core value. Let's keep growing. Let's keep learning. Let's keep, the more we grow, the more we would respect each other. The next time I see you in person, we are going to all walk down the street holding hands together. Mm-hmm. And I love smiling. That. Oh, we can't <laughs> wait to see to you guys again. Look, well, we look forward to getting with you guys again and keep doing the hard work. We appreciate you. We love you. Respect you. And uh, thanks for being our brother and sister. Thank, thank you so you. much, Kenny. We love you. Yeah.